All right, this is part three when we're talking about respiratory diseases and infections. We're gonna be looking at lung cancer first here. Now, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. Guys, it actually causes more deaths than a lot of the other more common that you hear about cancers as well, like breast cancer, prostate cancer, all of those added together is even less than the individuals who die of lung cancer. The issue with lung cancer is it's often asymptomatic. The patient doesn't even have symptoms until it metastasizes, until it moves to new areas like the brain, bones, or the liver. Now there's kind of two groups of lung cancers that are out there. There's the small cell lung cancer. This is known as oat cell as well. This is gonna be less frequent. We don't see it as often. However, it does grow super fast and it metastasizes quickly, it spreads quickly. And so this one definitely we do not catch until after it's already metastasized and spread to other areas. Now the non-small cell type of lung cancer is actually more common and it's treated a lot of times with surgery. However, this non-small cell is very closely linked to cigarette smoking. Now they both have a link, okay, but the more common one is caused by cigarette smoking for the most part. Now symptoms, when we have lung cancer, we see that they'll have dyspnea, coughing, and they may also have the sputum with the blood that's present. Diagnosis by an x-ray and also a tissue biopsy may need to be done. And the main treatments here, if treatment can be given, because a lot of times it's already spread and it's harder than to treat and control at that point, are chemotherapy, radiation, and possible surgery. Okay, especially if a lobe has a pretty large tumor, they may surgically remove that lobe okay, in order to help maybe prevent the spread and also increase the functionality of that particular lung. All right, the next thing we want to talk about are diseases of the pleural and the chest kind of cavity. These can be caused by infection, trauma, or other diseases. And the main symptoms we have when the pleura or the chest cavity is affected are pain, okay, and it can be very specific pain, which we'll talk about in a minute, and also shortness of breath. Now, these can be mild to, to severe depending on the cause. But there's also some other factors that come into play. What caused it, the individual's age could affect how severe it is, their medical history, and other complicating factors, like if they already have COPD or they already have lung cancer or other things like that, it obviously could increase the risk and the severity. So diseases of the pleural and chest cavity, these are the most common. The first one is known as pleurisy or pleuritis. This is inflammation of the membranes that are covering the lungs. We do, that this, we do see that this causes a lot of times what they call a friction rub. A friction rub is a squeaking noise that you can actually hear when you listen to their chest cavity. Sharp chest pain is going to also be present here, okay? So pleuritis or pleurisy is going to be where we have lots of inflammation in that pleural, that cavity that goes around the lungs. We also see there's the pneumothorax and pneumothorax is air in the pleural cavity. Air is then gonna push and put pressure on the lung and it could ultimately cause the lung to collapse. This could be a complication of certain diseases like pulmonary infections that are present, a tumor, or also a pulmonary tissue tear. If the actual lung is torn, it could release air into that cavity. Some other trauma type things that can cause pneumothorax would be like gunshot wounds, stabbings, and even fractures like rib fractures. Now, a little different than a pneumothorax is a hemothorax. Hemothorax is the same issue, but instead of air in the cavity, it is blood. Okay, so there's blood in the cavity. Now the main way to, to help correct this and it reinflate the lung is putting in a chest tube. Okay, this is a, th a thoracocentesis. A thoracocentesis is where they put a chest tube in. And if they put the chest tube in and the, and the chest reinflates, but nothing really seemed to have come out the tube, then that was gonna be a pneumothorax because air did come out. If it then also reinflates, but blood comes out of the chest tube, then obviously that was a hemothorax. Now, if fluid comes out that's more clear, we would call this a pleural effusion or a hydrothorax. Okay, so this is fluid in the chest cavity, but it's not blood. Okay, so this would be like that interstitial type of fluid. 
We also see that there can be the empemia. This is pus in the chest cavity. Pus in the chest cavity is a lot of times result of a ruptured lung abscess. Okay, so those abscesses we talked about in part two, they, if they rupture, this can actually cause pus to develop in this cavity. Now, remember when we talked about the cardiovascular system that we discussed how the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system are kind of like intertwined. They're really important together. This is again why with CPR, we check the airway, we check their breathing, and then we watch their circulation because those three things are the kind of life-saving things that we need to make sure are still working. And so these systems are very closely linked. So here are some examples of some issues that can happen if one of them is not functioning properly, it ultimately can affect the other. So pul pulmonary embolism is an example here with PE. This is a sudden blockage of an artery by an embolism in the actual lung itself. Okay, so this is gonna be where an embolism or a thrombosis, a blood clot or something comes in and it blocks the artery. But instead of it blocking an artery on the heart and causing a heart attack or blocking an artery in the brain and causing a stroke, this blocks an artery in the actual lung and we call that a pulmonary embolism. Now, this is gonna depend on the severity of this, is gonna depend on how big it is and how much of the lung is affected, but these can be life-threatening. We also see pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is where tissue and air spaces in the lungs start to fill with fluid. A lot of times this is linked to congestive heart failure as a whole. But if we're talking specifically about right-sided congested heart failure, we actually see like we saw back in the cardiovascular system, we talked about this, the core pulmonary. All right, so these are just some of the particular ones that are going to be lung issues, but ultimately the underlining cause of the problem came from the cardiovascular system. All right, now there's some trauma that can happen, of course, to the respiratory system. We talked about a pneumo and hemothorax. Those often can occur due to some type of trauma like gunshots, stabbings, fractures of the rib cage, that kind of thing could result in a pneumothorax or a hemothorax. We also see another type of trauma is a suffocation. Suffocation is where you're not breathing to the point that the individual loses consciousness and then eventually dies. Now, some causes could be due to aspiration where you breathe in something that you shouldn't, and this is gonna be where you're choking. Hey, when we talk about the universal sign, they're choking, that kind of sort of thing. The Heimlich is the main thing used here. But if we cannot restore the um, flow of air, it ultimately would cause suffocation. We also see strangulation. Strangulation can be done by accident. It could be on purpose, like self-inflicted, or it could be a type of murder in that sense, a type of crime. And so strangulation could occur, and this could be done by like a rope or hands or something, but it's going to be a crushing of this area. Hey, a lot of times how we diagnose that in a sense during an autopsy, it's not really a diagnosis, but we're trying to find the cause of death is going to be where the hyoid bone, which is the bone not connected to any other bone in the body, is broken or bruised. And then drowning. Drowning is normally the leading cause of accidental deaths, especially in children and adolescents, and specifically adolescent males for some reason. Now, when we look at drowning, there are two forms. There is a wet drowning, which is what you kind of normally think of when we talk about drowning, where they get in and they, they've breathed in the water, the water's in their lungs. However, there's also dry drowning that can happen. This could be where they may have breathed in some water and coughed it in, that kind of thing, had trouble while they were swimming. But the drowning happens later, and this is normally due to a spasm that occurs with the um, epiglottis. The epiglottis normally covers your trachea so that you do not inhale what you eat or drink, and the spasm can actually close the trachea off, which causes them to not be able to breathe, okay? And this is normally linked to them being in water somehow and things like that, and so that's why they call it dry drowning. All right, so some rare diseases here. We have some rare diseases, and the first one is the pneumoconiosis. This is gonna be environmentally induced disease that causes progressive chronic inflammation and infection in the lungs. This is gonna be normally due to you breathing in something that's a lot of times an occupational type hazard, something you breathe in on a regular basis. 
One of the most um, common causes is asbestos. Asbestos used to be used to help fireproof buildings and insulate them. However, we know now when that gets dislodged and loose, if you're breathing that in as like a construction worker or something like that, it can cause major issues because it looks like little shards of glass when we take a biopsy of the lungs. Okay, so this causes chronic type of inflammation and infection. We also see that there's the anthroanosis and this one is going to be where you breathe in carbon or coal a lot. This is seen a lot of times with coal miners or individuals who work in mines. So that's a lot of times known as coal miners disease or black lung is what kind of happens because it causes that to turn. There's also the silicosis. Silicosis is going to be an occupational hazard for uh, glass cutters as well as sandblasters and stone masonry, um, those that are stonemasons. Um, the reason is, again, they're breaking that stuff up, that sand and all that has silica in it. Glass is actually made out of sand. And so that silica also can get breathed in and it can cause irritation and friction within the lungs. Okay, so this is, this is a pretty rare disease, but it is something that has caused us to kind of change um, the way that we address asbestos. Like if a building's old and we have to clean it out, we've used different products now for insulation. Um, when we look at some of those occupational hazard type of jobs, it's where they wear a mask that filters all that kind of stuff out for the most part. And so we do see that there are some protective measures that could be done. Some other rare diseases include the fungal diseases. These are caused by inhaling airborne fungus known as spores. This isn't very common because fungus tends to normally be infections on our skin, like more superficial, but it can go deeper and there's two forms. There's two forms. There's the histoplasmosis. The histoplasmosis is normally the type of fungus that's found in bird droppings, specifically in like chicken houses or chicken coops if you go in there and it gets kicked up. Um, bat caves, not the bats themselves, but in the bat caves where there's a lot of times those little swallows and stuff that are in the opening. Okay, that kind of bird dropping can cause issues and pigeon roosts. Okay, so those are going to be some main things that cause some issues with that histoplasmosis. Coccidiomycosis. Coccidiomycosis is a fungus that's found in more hot, dry areas. And so this is linked a lot of times to a desert fever or valley fever. Another rare disease we have is called is Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease gets its name because it caused a major kind of outbreak issue in 1976 at an American Legion convention event in Philadelphia. It was related to the um, air conditioning units in those buildings. And so this particular bacteria was able to grow in those vents within that, that structure. And when it came out through the systems, it infected a lot of people. And it is a pulmonary infection, but it's not limited to the pulmonary system. It could ultimately cause liver damage and also renal dysfunction. So it doesn't just stay in the lungs, it can spread. Okay, and again, this is a kind of rare one, especially not how we know now how it's transmitted. We would watch for those sort of things. The last thing are the effects of aging that we see on the lungs. We see that they are decreasing their elasticity as we age. This makes them become less efficient. Um, we have less reserve inside of them, and so there's a higher chance of those lungs collapsing a lot of times. We also see that the muscles of the respiratory system begin to weaken as we age. We see there's reduced resistance to infection. Our immune system can't take care of infections as easily. And then smoking, of course, is the major cause of high incidence of lung cancer. And we do see that individuals, um, especially right now who are kind of older, they grew up where smoking was not really an issue. It was kind of a cool thing to do. And so now that was before we have warning labels on cigarettes and now we do. Now it doesn't stop everybody from smoking, but they do put it out there that it can be a major issue and we do see it later on. It's not seen normally in your 20s and 30s. It's later on in life, the effects of that smoking that you did come back and get you with age. All right, so that finishes up looking at the respiratory infections and diseases. Again, if you have any questions, please let me know.